I can't walk past a pond without having a, a good peer in. Because when you look closely, you actually see it's teeming with life. It might be tiny little things, but there's absolutely loads going on. It's a special moment when you come across a pond nestled within farmland. A lush area of blue and green found amongst the fields of crops or domesticated animals. This is a place where other kinds of life can flourish. There's a little pond skater coming towards us. Tiny little water flea, water beetles scuttling around, water boatmen. Welcome to Waterlands, a series brought to you by WWT. I'm Megan McCubbin, a zoologist and conservationist. And this series is a journey through some of the richest habitats on planet Earth. Ponds. They are incredibly special places, full of all kinds of life. And in this episode, we're looking at farmland ponds in particular. They're a sight which used to be common. Walking across farmland, you'd always pass a pond or two. They're sources of water for animals, for crops, and of course, havens for wildlife. But farmland ponds have grown increasingly rare. They've often been overgrown, or had their waters drained, or even filled in and planted over. On many farms, it's hard to spot where the ponds used to be. Ponds bring so many benefits to wildlife and to farmers. So in this episode, we're meeting people building new farmland ponds or bringing old ones back to life. There's all kinds of bird life coming in here already, which is really great to see. We're starting at Riverford. It's an organic farm growing vegetables and with dairy cattle grazing its fields in the Devon countryside. The Riverford ethos is to farm in harmony with nature. And that's where their new pond comes in. You can just see a swallow at the moment just having a little drink <laughs> and washing itself on the side. And now the wagtails are coming in too. And the dragonflies. Anna David looks after sustainability at Riverford. She's helped design and build this pond. It's been here for two or three months now. It's slowly filling up, probably about half full. It's starting to vegetate up in a way that we'd expect. Bits of meadow sweet starting to poke up out of the water. Some of the common rush. This was an idea that I had when I first started working on the farm about 18 months ago. Just thinking, like, where can we put a pond? <laughs> because um, it, it's just one of the best ways to introduce more life into any kind of farmed landscape, really, is just um, creating a pond. We have a really great digger driver called Martin Widger. He's dug a lot of ponds in his time. <laughs> it was really brilliant, actually, because he knew exactly where all the land drains were because his dad used to work on the farm as well and he put them in. <laughs> and when Martin was a boy, he kind of helped him out a bit and he knew where to dig the pond and where to make sure that the water was going to fill up from. We've got footpaths around the farm, so there are quite a few dog walkers coming and going. And I was like, oh God, what are they going to think? Like, <laughs> we're creating a kind of moonscape. Um, and I had a, a chat with a couple of them and they were all really excited about it. So they're looking forward to coming back, you know, time and again and seeing how it progresses. It's hard to imagine what the site looked like before now. <laughs> This pond is part of a network of ponds and reservoirs. They provide water for the Riverford animals and crops and a space for wildlife. The site has been transformed from a boggy field margin to a pond about 100 metres square. It's got a wiggly outline and an island in the middle. As Anna tells us, it's all about the edges. Most of the wildlife is going to be in that first kind of 10, 15 centimetres of the, the shallow areas of the pond. So the more of that you've got, the better. You want them to be deep enough so that you know, the areas of it would allow for frogs to hibernate over winter and that kind of thing. But you want most of it to be nice and shallow. It's already attracting in a whole tonne of wildlife. So we've seen a swallow darting in. 
probably feeding on some of the insects above the water. Ponds are a really important source of water for a lot of farm wildlife, so bats and birds and other mammals. It's full of, of dragonflies and damselflies that are laying their eggs into the water and those eggs will then turn into the larvae and the larvae will then start eating some of the other species that have also turned up in the water already, so some of the boatmen, some of the other like smaller pond life. <laughs> and in turn those will provide food for things like the frogs and the toads and the newts that will be coming in hopefully within the next year or so. The place that we built the pond, it was a sort of a, a slightly boggy area of the farm. We couldn't cultivate here, it was, it was a bit too wet, but it wasn't actually that great for wildlife either. There wasn't much life in it. I'm pretty confident that what we've got here is going to be way better than what we had before. So everyone's getting quite excited whenever someone from the farm team comes down here. They'll report back and say like, oh, we saw the pond is filling up and there's loads of dragonflies. And it's really nice to hear people getting enthusiastic about it. Riverford is a working farm. And as the pond matures, it will become an important part of their pond network and will also help boost the farm business. So this pond is creating part of this network alongside the stream, which um, includes another older pond, which is probably about 50 metres further upstream. It's a different habitat, really. It's right out in the open. It's a very sunny position. Further up again, the reservoirs. So we've got two reservoirs. We have got a lovely network of ponds now. So ponds traditionally were probably dug for reservoirs but also as feeding areas for livestock. Ponds now are probably a bit more to do with the sort of holistic view of farm management. So you're trying to attract in things, even things like toads. But in general, they're supporting pollinators. They'll be supporting bird species that might be nibbling away some of those caterpillars and things that are pests on the farm. They're bringing in more diversity. And there's another bit of the wild space around the farm. We have lost a lot of ponds over the last hundred years or so in this country. By creating new ponds where wildlife can congregate, you're creating more spaces where they can move through the landscape and ideally there are positive outcomes for the farm too. None of the change that's needed is possible without farmers. And at Riverford, that's Guy Singh Watson, He's been farming here all his 63 years, and his family for a long time before that too. Come on, where's the edge stick? My dog, uh, my spaniel, has just gone in the pond. He's chasing a duck, which he hasn't got any chance of getting. <laughs> Guy transformed the farm by going organic 35 years ago, developing a philosophy of farming in harmony with nature. But the family farm hadn't always been like that. Well, even when my father started farming at Riverford in 1951, there were quite a lot of ponds around the farm, and they were where the cattle drank. And um, amazingly, there were ponds right up on top of the hill that stayed full of water right through summer. And in those ponds were you know, all the wildlife that you get around ponds. My dad, bless him, he became a real environmentalist by the end of his life, his 94 years. But his first half of his life, got out of the army after the war, you know, Britain was still in food rationing. Science was everything, and that scale, and, and you know, there was no humility in those days. Yeah, so he, he bulldozed the hedges, we were a demonstration farm for ICI, filled in the ponds. And, um, well, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that the ponds were filled in with every bit of crap that a farmer wanted to get rid of. I mean, it's absolutely shameful. I mean, I can remember, and I'm going back to the 60s, a pond on the farm full of pesticide containers. It makes me, you know, very uncomfortable to think about it. And then that was filled in with lots of other rubbish. And then it, they would have closed, uh, closed in over the top. I mean, it is just, you know, absolutely horrendous. I, you know, I think those were very different times with different values. Riverford weren't alone in losing their ponds there's been a dramatic reduction in farmland ponds over the last 50 years. Agriculture changed after the war, driven by the need to feed a booming population, using the latest technology, the latest pesticides. It might have been an exciting time to be a farmer, using a quick fix for a big problem, 
but there was little concern or knowledge available for how pesticides would impact soil health, wildlife and the greater environment. Since the agricultural revolution, we've lost 50% of our biodiversity, with intensive farming being a major contributor. Today, Guy believes those impacts are clear to see. Industrial farming has absolutely desecrated the landscape. We've removed a huge amount of our hedgerows and woodlands, and we've replaced diverse pastures and meadows with you know, ryegrass, if you're lucky, with a bit of red clover in it. It's just an absolute environmental disaster. So how can we produce enough food and leave space for nature, while still encouraging farmers to bring back their ponds? Farmers aren't going to build ponds and let areas go for nature unless they're paid to. They need to be paid and they need to be educated and encouraged. We can farm in a way that provides space for nature with absolutely minimal impact on how much food we produce. The best way to do that, I think, in Devon and anyway, where we have lots of really sort of marginal areas where it's hard to farm economically, is just to lose our obsession with tidiness. We can you know, not drain those boggy bits in the corner of the field that, you know, it's really marginal. We've started creating ponds, you know, for irrigation and already there has been a whole succession of insect life. It is amazing how quickly, you know, nature will <laughs> take over. The benefits of a diverse farm landscape are considerable and sometimes surprising. You do get the benefits just from the diversity and, and the most obvious tangible one will be the toads. So, you know, if we grow lettuces in the field behind us, the toads will come out and they will, um, you know, they absolutely decimate the slugs. I mean, they are very effective um, slug control. You know, it's, it's part of that principle of encouraging broad diversity, which will then lead to a sort of ecologically stable habitat, whereby you won't get these large masses of slugs because there's something there to eat them and we won't get loads of aphids because there's something there to eat them and that they keep in a sort of balance. We will be putting in three more ponds similar uh, to this one, probably a little bit smaller actually, which will be just purely dedicated to wildlife and and indeed I was walking around this morning and I just had another little wet area in a field where the cattle had been making a mess and you know, a former me would have said, right, I'd better put a drain in there <laughs> and get that out. But now I think, oh, yeah, now I could, I could make a pond here. You know, I suppose my way of looking at the landscaping at the farm now is far more where is there an opportunity for wildlife. There's a poem about a farm pond that I've discovered, which takes us right back in time. It's by John Clare, and he worked as a farm labourer back in the 1800s. He wrote a lot about wildlife on farmland, and this one is about a swallow. Pretty swallow, once again, come and pass me in the rain. Pretty swallow, why so shy? Pass again my window by. The horse pond where he dips his wings. The wet day prints its full of rings. The raindrops on his track lodge like pearls upon his back. Then again he dips his wings in the wrinkles of the spring. Then o'er the rushes flies again, and pearls roll off his back like rain. Such beautiful words, and what a special skill it is to engage imagination, to make you feel like you're there in the moment, watching the droplets of water fall from the swallow's back. Just magical. But it's not just swallows which might point the way to water. As you become more familiar with the landscape, you can spot clues to which habitat you are approaching. Willow trees are a great marker for streams, but one of my favourite things to look out for are insect chimneys. These amazing scenes can help you spot a pond on your walk across farmland. Sarah Davies from WWT joined me to explore this incredible natural wonder. An insect chimney is a mass of emerging insects that will have started their lives underwater they might have spent several years as larvae and nymphs underwater and then they emerge from the surface of the water in the summer months or the late spring months. Creatures like mayflies, caddisflies, midges and mosquitoes. And these will emerge from the surface of the water forming a cloud. 
looks like a plume of smoke coming off the top of the pond. And they're quite mesmerising to witness and you'll also hear wonderful sounds of insect hum. The reason I really like these is because they are providing an immense food source for farmed landscapes where we've seen quite a huge decline in insect abundance. Ponds are providing an excellent source of flying insects that birds and bats and amphibians can feed on. You know, I actually saw an insect chimney. This was about a year ago. I've seen a few, but this one time I was able to stand within it. And I went and I put myself in the middle of this insect chimney and I had them all buzzing around me. And it was the most amazing sensation and feeling. It's really great to see it. It is quite obvious. And once you see it, you can't really mistake it. So you'll have some days where you don't have very many and then all of a sudden it gets warm enough and bang, you've got a huge cloud of them above the pond. Once you start to notice them, they're just everywhere. Yeah, they're really important and um, yeah, really nice things to see as well. Creating or reviving farmland ponds can have a rejuvenating effect on the landscape. And as the ponds return, wildlife which used to be common in farmland can return too but it often needs a helping hand. Ealing Wildlife Group in London has had some amazing successes. Who would have thought that you'd be able to spot peregrines, harvest mice and barn owls all within the city? They are now trying to support the Great Crested Newt, a beautiful rare species which is protected and sadly in decline. Farmland ponds are crucial to its survival so we've been to their farm in the heart of London with vet and conservationist Dr Sean McCormack, who set up the Ealing Group in 2016. It's probably the only place in Ealing where you can look up and see these massive glorious skies. You could be anywhere in the countryside, surrounded by trees and meadows, big landscapes and big skies. And uh, right now it's absolutely buzzing with life. It's amazing. Chickens here and cockerel. And they've just had little chicks recently. You can see the pigs in the woods over here, little piglets. Three or four of them now. You can hear them eager for their breakfast, I think. Hello, piggies. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? This farm is home to a network of historic farm ponds, now revitalised and managed for the benefit of wildlife. It's a working farm with wildlife flourishing too. Sean walked us across the meadows, past the grazing cattle, to the reed-fringed ponds, the centrepiece of the newt's habitat. Grey-crested newts are so special. They are like this magical little symbol of wilderness, but they're also little dragons. They are absolutely incredible looking. They are our largest aquatic amphibian, kind of 14 to 17 centimetres in length. And the male in the breeding season is really the one where you go, this is a little dragon. He's got this massive undulating spiky crest, which gives him his name. That's visible in the water. It's like really, really high wavy crest along his back. He's got gorgeous little orange toe tips. So the tips of his toes are orange. And under his belly is this really vivid markings, orange belly with loads of black spots and patterns on it. This is one of the ponds that the Great Crested Newts breed in. So you can see it's quite large. Then you've got some bulrushes here on this side. You've got some different grass and sedge species on the other. But it's got quite a bit of open water. And what Great Crested Newts like is a large pond. The deep water is important to regulate the temperature of the pond, but the shallow edges is the place where all the life is really buzzing because more light is penetrating the water. The water is alive, little beetles and little invertebrates popping up to get air and jumping back down. Tiny little Daphnia, which are a type of water flea. It's got um, submerged vegetation and the newts will be using that to wrap their eggs in and protect them when they're laying in spring. So it might just look like a bit of a muddy pool, but it's quite rich in life in there. The pond is providing the food for the newts to flourish. What's enabling that is the work that Sean and the group are doing by managing the site with nature in mind. So it's really important that we exclude the cattle from getting in to the pond itself because they can do quite a bit of harm. So you can see we've um, put up some fencing um, around the ponds just to exclude livestock. 
So we think that the population of Great Crested Newts here is a remnant historic population. We haven't put the newts here. Um, so we're trying to bolster the population by creating a couple of new ponds here and there, but maintaining the existing ponds they love in the state that they, they want them in and in the kind of optimal habitat. These ponds don't have the same kind of dynamic processes and systems that they would have had hundreds of years ago. If we had our wild boar, we had beavers in our wetlands, they'd be coming in and grazing a lot of this. They'd be mashing up the banks and creating open vegetation. Um, beavers would be felling trees like this poplar and these alders and, and birch and creating big pulses of light and open space that really supercharged the biodiversity and the life within the ecosystem. So we do uh, traditional conservation methods like clearance of vegetation, coppicing some of the surrounding trees and things like beavers used to do. If we didn't manage these ponds, they would eventually dry up and fill in and revert to woodland. Did you see that? Just as we're speaking, I've just seen a newt. That was a newt popping up for air. It's just gone down. It just takes a second. They just break the surface of the water and then go back down. But um, because great crested newts are a protected species and because this is a quite important time in their breeding cycle, I don't want to you know, deliberately go in there and causing disturbance. We manage it for great crested newts, but we also have a lot of other things here like bats and birds. We just heard a, a reed warbler singing behind us in the next pond. Um, you know, we're creating kind of rich habitats that great crested newts want, and um, we're seeing the benefits in lots of other species too. And if we can use great crested newt conservation as a way to protect this large expanse of green space and keep it intact and wonderful for people to come here and walk in nature and not see a single sign of civilization, which is really remarkable for London, then I think um, grey crested newts are a good tool for us to do that. How exactly are farmland ponds doing? Are there more than there were? Are there less than there were? What's that habitat looking like these days? Unfortunately, there's been a huge decline in farmland ponds, so they were once very, very common, and it's estimated that it's about a 50% decline in, in ponds. And many of these have been lost to um, agricultural intensification. We've now got about 500,000 ponds in the UK, down from about 800,000 ponds in the 19th century. So it's a, it's a big loss. There's been a lot of effort recently to restore ponds and manage ponds, and that has caused a little bit of an increase. I think they're slightly on the rise again now. But if we compare the state of things now compared to 100 years ago, then it is a completely different picture, unfortunately. It's a real significant change to the landscape then, isn't it, ultimately? And I think when you're walking through any habitat, sometimes you can see clues of what habitat you're approaching, but you can also see clues of what habitats were there before. And there are specific indicators of when a pond used to be there. Yes, you might find a clump of trees. Sometimes there's still a bit of water left and it's a wet woodland or sometimes there's no trees at all and it's just a sort of bare depression in the ground, but the vegetation might be different or it might be in a crop field and there's no crops in that circle. And you can see sort of damp, muddy habitat or perhaps some signs that there used to be vegetation like reeds. And that indicates that what you have there is a ghost pond, a pond that was there perhaps in the 19th century or even more recently than that, but that's been filled in. These ghost ponds are, are, are fascinating, but of course, without new ponds being naturally formed or managed, then we're losing potentially some really important species which are only found in these particular areas. Yeah, absolutely. So 70% of freshwater species in Europe are found in ponds. The best thing we can do really is, is to have a, a varied landscape, a nice rich network of ponds at different stages. That will be optimal for biodiversity. I mean, a lot of the time when we're talking about these kind of habitats, it's either farmland or nature. That seems to be the way that the conversation is going. But actually, nature can be at the heart of farming. It should be very much at the heart of farming. Are you seeing a change in kind of perspectives and opinions when it comes to putting ponds into farmland? Yeah, a lot of farmers are already aware of the benefits of, of ponds on their farmland. And actually, a lot of the kind of pond management, pond restoration work has actually been inspired by farmers. Usually farmers, they like wildlife and they can see the benefits that wildlife bring for farming as well. 
the reduction in pests, for example. So often it's just about having a conversation and speaking to them about the other benefits, such as livestock watering or sequestering carbon. Um, but a lot of this is about how we can make it profitable for farmers to keep these areas um, that are high value for wildlife on their land. We have a range of different projects that involve working with farmers to encourage the kind of stewardship or creation of wetlands, including ponds. And we're also looking at ways at WWT to find new ways of making wildlife conservation a bit more financially sustainable for landowners. So ways that they can make money from setting aside areas of land or re-wetting areas that would have been drained previously um, on floodplains. So all sorts of ways that contribute to nature conservation. Farmers are central to any transformation. And back at Riverford, Guy Singh Watson is looking across his new pond, nestled among the rolling hills of Devon. He's casting his mind forwards, imagining the change in the pond as the years go by, and thinking how he can help. Well, I'm, I'm envisaging coming back in a year's time. There may be some bulrushes coming up and sedges and grasses, and you will see the first alders coming up around the edge, I'm sure, next spring. I'm sure there'll be ducks and maybe geese nesting on the island. And, and then over the years, it will just, there'll be a, just a succession, and you will get more and more trees growing around the edge, and then there will be a debate about what is environmentally best. You also want sunlight getting to it, so you want a mixture of different habitats. And that will probably require a degree of intervention, you know, occasionally coming and cutting down some of the trees to the, let the light in. There's a really beautiful old saying that says a society grows great when an old man plants a tree whose shade they shall never sit in. And that has so many meanings on so many different levels. And I think whilst it's true for trees, it's also true for ponds too. If we can restore, revitalise and build farmland ponds, then the benefits will be long-standing for both people and wildlife. Probably to the degree that we will never really know, but we know how important and good they are. We just need them to be scattered amongst the landscape even more. For more information on farmland ponds and for fascinating nature stories, sign up for emails at www.wwt.org.uk and follow WWT on our socials. Waterlands is an 1860 production for WWT. The producer is Melvin Rickaby.